No, I don't think so. Nice try. So I'll change things up today. Read in a little different order. Today we're going to read from the book of Mark, chapter 16, about the resurrection. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they could embalm him. Very early on Sunday morning, as the sun rose, they went to the tomb. They worried out loud to each other, who will roll back the stone from the tomb for us? And they looked up and saw that it had been rolled back. It was a huge stone, and they walked right in. They saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed all in white. They were completely taken aback, astonished. He said, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, the one whom they nailed to the cross. He's been raised up. He is here no longer. You can see for yourselves that the place is empty. Now, on your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going on ahead of you to Galilee. You'll see him there, exactly as he said. They got out as fast as they could, beside themselves, their heads swimming. Stunned, they said nothing to anyone. After rising from the dead, Jesus appeared early on Sunday morning to Mary Magdalene, whom he had delivered from seven demons. She went to his former companions, now weeping and carry on, carrying on, and told them. When they heard her report that she had seen him alive and well, they didn't believe her. Later he appeared, but in a different form, to two of them out walking in the countryside. They went back and told the rest, but they weren't believed either. Still later, as the eleven were eating supper, he appeared and took them to task most severely for their stubborn unbelief, refusing to believe those who had seen him raised up. Then he said, Go into the world, go everywhere, and announce the message of God's good news to one and all. Whoever believes and is baptized is saved. Whoever refuses to believe is damned. These are some of the signs that will accompany believers. They will throw out demons in my name. They will speak in new tongues. They will take snakes in their hands. They will drink poison and not be hurt. They will lay hands on the sick and make them well. Then the Master Jesus, after briefing them, was taken up to heaven, and he sat down beside God in the place of honor. And the disciples went everywhere preaching, the Master working right with them, validating the message with indisputable evidence. You'll bow with me. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you are a mighty God, a God that is long-suffering and patient and kind with us, that you had foreplanned before we were ever created to redeem us, even though we would sin and rebel against you, knowing that it would cost you the life of your son. You set that up in the festivals and so forth, set up that at Passover so that we would look for that time, Father. But we missed it when Jesus came because we were looking for a different kind of Savior and a different kind of Lord. Lord, help us to not miss it in this time of the church that you have called us to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ, to proclaim that he is risen, to live a life differently by resurrecting power, by the power of spirit, the Spirit in our lives, to combat the, our enemy, the devil, and his forces, Lord, that we live in a world where we need to be aware of those things, Father, and to be a light in the darkness. Father, open up our minds and ears to hear your word today, Lord, to contemplate on exactly what Jesus Christ has done for us and to know that he is there by your side, Lord, uh, saying that we are your children, Lord, and preparing a home for us. And we know that without a doubt he will come, come for us and that we will forever be in your presence. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So if you read the sunrise service this morning, you're going to hear a little bit of repeats, but not a whole lot. I'm going to start reading with, from 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul is kind of summing up his letter to the church in Corinth. And they're eager to have the spiritual gifts and everything else, but they're really doing it for the wrong reasons. And 1 Corinthians 15 starts this way. Friends, let me go over the message with you one final time, the message that I proclaim and that you made your own. This message on which you took your stand and by which your life has been saved. I'm assuming now that your belief was the real thing and not just a passing fancy. 
that you're in this for good and holding fast. The first thing I did was place before you what was placed so emphatically before me, that the Messiah died for our sins, is that exactly as Scripture tells, that he was buried, that he was raised from dead, death on the third day. Again, exactly as Scripture says, that he presented himself alive to Peter, then to his closest friends, and later to more than 500 of his followers, all at the same time. Most of them are still around, although a few have died since. And he, he then spent time with James and the rest of those he commissioned to represent him, and that he finally presented himself alive to me. Here we are, Easter, 2,000 years later, however many years it's been, and we're still celebrating Paschal Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, the day that we recognize that Jesus was our Passover lamb slain for our sins and that he rose from the dead. That's something no other religion can claim. Where whoever, whatever thoughts they teach and everything else, they don't have a risen Savior. They don't have a risen Lord. I mentioned this morning that Pascha is Latin, which comes from the Hebrew word Pesach, which means Passover. The Passover that was referred to when God called his children out of Egypt to go out into the wilderness and worship him. If you read in Exodus, that comes around in Exodus chapter 12, verse 23, where we see that word. And it says, The Lord protected the Israelites from death by not allowing the destroyer, to, destroyer to, to enter their houses and strike them down. Exodus 12, 23. The overall picture of Exodus is redemption. And as we think about when the, the two walked down the road to Emmaus, Jesus talked to them about how all Scripture pointed to them and their hearts burned with the things that He told them. You've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins are forgiven and you serve a risen Savior. That is so much different, like I said, than any other religion can proclaim, period. You are a light in this world. Is your light shining before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven? As you read in Exodus, you read the story of, of the promise of Abraham, God's promise, and he is faithful and true to fulfill his promises. Jesus fulfilled many of the prophecies of the Old Testament, and he still has prophecies to, to fulfill. And one that is, he will return and take you as his own. As you read on through through the book of Exodus, you discover this deliverer named Moses, an unlikely deliverer, but one that brought the law of God. And you read about Aaron, the priest. And they told Pharaoh to let his people go, to let God's people go, so that they, that they could worship him out in the wilderness. Well, why were they out in the wilderness? Are we in a wilderness now? Do we have a promised land, a home that God has prepared for us? Do we have a hope that other religions don't have based on the fact that our Lord and Savior was not killed, but He laid down His life to pay our sin debt? And if you believe your sins have been ransomed, the price has been paid, you have been purchased back and given power to live by the power of the Holy Spirit, to be Jesus' hands and feet in this world, to be a light to this world. But Pharaoh wouldn't listen, and he oppressed the people harder and harder. So they got disgruntled and, and did not believe. And in Exodus chapter 6, God reestablishes his covenant with them. He says in chapter 6 verse 4, I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land where they lived as foreigners. Furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving, and I have remembered my covenant. Therefore tell the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians and deliver you from their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from, the, from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you into the land that I swore to give Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give, you as a, give it to you as a possession, for I am the Lord. Moses relayed this message to the Israelites, but on account of their broken spirit and cruel bondage, they did not listen to him. Fast forward many years, and here we are today. And we know that we have a new covenant written by the blood of Jesus Christ, that you are God's child, that all of his promises stand true. And you're not looking for a promised land here on earth. You're looking for a new heaven and a new earth. And that will happen if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 
So how are you living in this time in the wilderness? First of all, have you marked the doors with the blood of Jesus Christ so that death has no sting in your life? And then second of all, are you living and relying on God's manna, on his protection, following his laws in this world? Are you living like Christ? As we continue to read, God shows the world who he is. There are the ten plagues that we read about. If we reach chapter 11, which I just quoted from you, chapter 12, just a minute ago, the Passover angel, the death angel, was foretold. Anyone who did not mark their post, who did not believe in God, and then follow up in action by marking their post with that Passover lamb, death would visit their home and kill their firstborn child. But if you follow God's directions, if you put the, slay the lamb and put the blood over your doorpost, then death passed over you. God would not allow the destroyer to come in and take your firstborn. Have you put your faith in Jesus Christ? the one who died as our Passover lamb and who rose again, affirming to us without a doubt that we have resurrection hope. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month is the, be is the beginning of months for you. It stated a new calendar. Things were reset. It shall be the first month of your year. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of the month each man must select a lamb for his family, one per household. If the household is too small for a whole lamb, they are to share with the nearest neighbor based on the number of people and apportion the lamb accordingly. Your lamb must be unblemished year one, an unblemished one-year-old male, and you must take it from the sheep or the goats. You must keep until the 14th day of the month when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel will slaughter the animals at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of their house where they eat the lamb. They are to eat the meat that night, roasted over fire, along with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of the meat raw or cooked in boiled water, but only roasted over fire, its head and legs and inner parts. Do not leave any of it until morning. Before, before the morning, you must burn up any part that is left over. This is how you are to eat it. You must be fully dressed for travel with your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. You are to eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Wow. Are you dressed and ready to serve? That's what Jesus preached and taught, period. Is that how you live because you believe that he was slain for your sins and that he rose again to give you eternal life? That he has gone to prepare a home for you and you know where he's going because he is the way, the truth, and the life? that you know that he is the resurrection and the life? Is he the shepherd and do you follow his voice as the sheep? Are you dressed and serving the Lord so that you don't get caught unaware that that day may, when that day does occur? So in 1 Corinthians, we see how Paul connects Christ to the Passover lamb. He refers to Jesus as the Paschal lamb sacrificed for his people's salvation. Jesus celebrated the last supper, supper with the disciples and they didn't understand what he was saying. Even when he said, this is my blood poured out for you and this is my body broken for you, they did not understand that. And when he died, they were horrified. It was like the light had been extinguished. But the light was not extinguished because the light rose again. Jesus was not found in that tomb that Easter morning. Wow. Wow. If you've heard it referred to before in Catholicism, you might hear it referred to as the Pascal mystery. The mysteries of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you to proclaim to those that God is making reconciliation through you that men can be saved if you repent and turn to God, turn away from your sinful desires and turn to Jesus Christ. It's not a mystery to God's children. It's called the gospel message. And we know that it's without doubt because of that Easter morning. And Jesus taught something that is a fact that a lot of Christians do not understand. With death comes new life. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the ground, it cannot spring up a new life. When you look at a seed and you see a seed, maybe you can identify it because you've dealt with, with seeds and stuff before, but you see this tiny seed and then it turns into some type of plant and many are fruit-bearing plants. And who would ever dr dream from a little tomato seed you'd get this beautiful tomato that ripens with age? Are you bearing fruit in your life? Is the Spirit guiding you? 
Are you changing every day, growing up in maturity in the new creation that you already are coming to maturity? True life comes only from dying so that new life can be born. As we read in 1 Corinthians 15, as we read further, and I'm reading from the message if you wonder why it sounds a little differently, and Mark did too, but his isn't quite as much as mine. I, I like this next part. Starting in verse 12, Now let me ask you something profound yet troubling. If you become believers because you trusted the proclamation that Christ is alive, risen from the dead, how can you let people say that there is no such thing as resurrection? And believe me, that's still what they're saying today. That is the determining factor. They do not believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. They believe he was a fictitious person. They believe he was a legend. They believe he was a good philosopher. But they don't necessarily believe, unless they're a Christian, that he is God in the flesh, that death has no sting over him, and that he is alive today, that we serve a risen Lord. They just simply do not believe in the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, there is no living Christ. And face it, if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything you've, we've told you is smoke and mirrors. Everything that you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits we pass on to you verifying that God raised, raised up Christ. Sheer fabrications if there, are no, if there was no re resurrection. If corpses can't be raised, then Christ wasn't, because he was indeed dead. And if Christ were ra what weren't raised, then all you're doing is wandering about in the dark, as lost as ever. It's even worse for those who died hoping in Christ and resurrection, because they're already in their graves. If, we all, get, if all we get out of Christ is a little inspiration for just a few short years, we're a pretty sore lot. But the truth is that Christ has been raised up, the first in a long legacy of those who are going to leave the cemeteries. I love that. Death has no sting for you. Do you believe that? Because if you believe that, you should definitely live differently. This life is not your home. This life is like that compared to eternity. This life you're going to be accountable for in eternity. And God gave His one and only Son to die for you that you might live for Him. Do you understand that? Jesus tells this to Mary. He says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will... Or to Martha. Who is it? Now I'm confused. He said it to Martha. Martha, thank you. I confused myself. That's why I have to get myself clear now. I try my best not to get up here and tell you anything wrong, but sometimes my brain exceeds my mouth and sometimes it's vice versa. Jesus told to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And we know what happened there. After four days and Lazarus stinketh, I think that's the new NIV version stinketh. I like that part too. He called out to him and said, Come out of the grave. And the man, the body that was dead, wrapped in the linens, came out of the grave. I still can't picture that, but I just believe him kind of levitating out. <laughs> he came out and he, they told the people to unbound him because Lazarus was alive. Then you read in chapter 12 where the Pharisees and the other religious leaders were plotting to kill even Lazarus because he was telling his story about how he once was dead, but now he lived. That's your story. And then as we read on, some Greeks come to, to Jesus, so we've got the whole world coming to Jesus. And when he sees them, he says this, which might seem kind of strange that this is what he said, but it's not strange for you and I because we realize that only by death comes new life. John 12, 23 to 24, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus is the first fruits, calling us to live a life where we die to our sins, to our desires, to live for Him and tell others about resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Easter or Resurrection Day is not celebrated the same day of each year because it's not based on the calendar of the S-U-N. It's based on the calendar of the S-O-N. It's based on a lunar calendar. So that's why Easter changes. It's on, 
on March 31st this year, and I believe I couldn't find it before, and I didn't write it in my notes, but I don't think it's going to be on March 31st until 2040 or 2060 again. It takes quite a while to come back around. You're shaking your head. You found it, or you don't know. Okay. But whatever day it is to you, for, for you, oh, what day is it for you? Because for other people, it could be Transgender Visibility Day. Have you heard of that? That's not anything new, but boy, did it come out this year because it fell on Easter. That was established back in 2009. But the reason you're going to hear about it this Easter so much is because we fight a spiritual battle. And we're called to proclaim the light where others are pro called to proclaim the, the deeds of darkness of their master. It's also World Backup Day. Did you know that? You don't even probably know what that is. Maybe you know what it is. It's Daylight Savings Day for some other places. It's even National Tater Day. But what day is it for Christians? It is the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And there's not a person in this world as they face death that will not wonder what their life was, what is to become, anything else. And you have the truth to proclaim and you can't tell them the truth if you don't live the truth. The sins of humanity were paid by the death of Jesus Christ. And then he rose again, assuring us of eternal life. It is power, resurrecting power for the believer. Paul cried that out in the way that he lived and what he, what he wrote. It is anticip anticipation of our own resurrection and eternity with God, reestablished in the new bond where there is no sin, there is no suffering, there is no shame. It will all be wiped away. Every tear will be dried. Easter symbolizes new beginnings. It still does in the Easter bunny and everything like that. It is victory over death. They never expected a risen Savior. They never expe expected an empty tomb. They expected to embalm a dead body, that their hopes would be li lying in a grave. So tell the world the resurrection hope that you have. So I want to ask you a question before I close. I've got a little more scripture to read also, but this is a question I want you to contemplate as I read that scripture. What does resurrection power mean to you? It meant a lot to the apostles. It meant a lot to the early church because they gave up the way that they lived. As you read in Acts, you read that Barnabas and others gave up all their possessions, sold them and gave them to the poor so that there was not anybody in need. If you study scripture and you, and you study history and everything, you know that the apostles went on to martyrdom because they would not not profess Jesus Christ as saved. What they preached, the early apostle creed that we have was that Jesus Christ, according to scriptures, came. He was put to death according to scriptures and that he rose again. Do you believe that? You don't have to have a big testimony. You just have to have the faith and pray to God that your faith is increased to tell the story why you are different, the new life that you have, because you're not that old creation that you were before that was tainted by your sins. So you planted that in the ground. You planted that seed in the ground, no matter how big or small or what that seed looked like, and now there is a plant growing and fruit producing, and it's all because you are a new creation in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read first from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through, I guess, about 21. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our trespasses. It is by grace you have been saved, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages He might display the surpassing richness of His grace, demonstrated by His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that you cannot boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance as our way of life. Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles in the flesh and called uncircumcision by so-called circumcision, that done in the body by human hands, Remember that at, at that time you were separate from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of the promises, without hope and without God in the world. But now Christ Jesus, 
But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Verse 13, that's where I'm going to stop. He also wrote to the church at Philippi in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, But what was, whatever was gained to me I count as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things as loss compared to the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, from whom I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering, being conformed to Him in His death. And so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead, now that I have, not that I have already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of what that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining, straining forward to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize of God's heavenly calling in Christ Jesus. All of us who are mature should embrace this point of view, and if you think differently about some issue, God will reveal this to you as well. Nevertheless, we must live up to what we have already obtained. Join one another in following my examples, brothers, and carefully observe those who walk according to the pattern we set for you. For as I have often told you before, and now say again, with, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but... Complete opposite. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who rose that first Easter morning, who by the power that enables Him to subject all things to Himself will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious bodies. Proof and power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to finish by reading some more in 1 Corinthians 15 from the message. Starting in verse 21. There is nice symmetry in this. Death initially came by a man, and resurrection from death came by a man. Everyone dies in Adam. Everybody comes alive in Christ. But we have to wait our turn. Christ is first. And those with him at his coming, the grand consummation when after crushing the opposition, he hands over his kingdom to God the Father. He won't let up until the last enemy is down and the very last enemy is death. As the psalmist said, he laid them low one and all. He walked all over them. When scripture says that he walked all over them, it's obvious that he couldn't at the same time be walked on. When everything and everyone is finally under God's rule, the sun will step down taking his place with everyone else, showing that God's rule is absolutely comprehensive, a perfect ending. Why do you think people offer themselves to be baptized for those already in the grave, if there's no chance of resurrection for a corpse? If God's power stops at the cemetery gates, why do we keep doing things that suggest that he's going to clean the place out someday, pulling everyone up on their feet alive? And why do you think I keep risking my neck in this dangerous work? I look death in the face practically every day that I live. Do you think I'd do this if I wasn't convinced of, our resurrection, of, of your resurrection and mine as guaranteed by the resurrected Messiah, Jesus? Do you think I was just trying to act heroic when I fought the wild beasts at Ephesus, hoping it, would be the, hoping it wouldn't be the end of me? Not on your life. It's resurrection resurrection, always resurrection, that undergirds what I do, what I say, and how I live. From the message. A resurrected Savior changes everything. So what does Jesus' resurrection look in your life today? Oh, I mentioned before that today was backup day, and probably a lot of you don't know what that is. That's a day set aside when you should back up everything that's important to you out there in the digital world from photos to goods to everything else because any day the enemy could come in and attack all that you hold dear and take it all away the only way that you can back up the files of your life especially eternal life is by putting your trust in Jesus Christ in Jesus Christ alone 
So many of us may back up our photos and take care of this and that and, and take these precautions. But are you fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith? Do you realize that he has risen to give you life, life eternal and abundant life today? Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that all things were taken care of as far as our sin debt on the cross by Jesus Christ. We also thank you, Lord, that he rose from the dead, just as Scripture said, so that we know that we serve a risen Savior and Lord, and so that we know also that we will have eternal life, that we will be resurrected. And just as Paul tries to tell the Corinthian church here that there is no way to compare what's planted in the ground and what grows out afterwards, we have no idea the things in, in store for us. So may we build up treasures in heaven rather than build up treasures on earth. May we build a firm foundation in Jesus Christ and in your word and through the spirit, Lord, rather than building up treasures here on earth so that that day when the torrents come that our house will stand, Father, and that our house will stand for our children and our children's children because we'll write your words on the doorposts of our, not only our hearts, but on our homes, and we'll talk about you when we get up and when we go about and everything else, especially in this world when so many things even compete for Easter, Father, that we may be a light to a dark world. Father, we thank you and praise you for Jesus Christ and the resurrection. May we be, live like resurrected children until we meet Jesus face to face. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.